representation that you're, you're recording. So you can't really do that through a NetBeans installer or a default GUI interface. You need control over the actual listeners, the sockets, and I'll, I'll go into this in more details. And also, you've got to accept some limitations. So if you send um, approximately, I don't know, 2 million fuzzing requests, well, you're not going to be able to row sort all those with 64 megabytes of heap when you're launching a, jar, a standard jar file. So there's some, there's some limitations to address. That's, that's the easy part, the user interface. Now, the real problem when it comes to fuzzing is that no one has, to my knowledge, defined how you group the actual payloads into categories and use those categories so that they represent the least amount of work that you need to do to achieve putting on the wire whatever cross-site scripting or SQL injection or hex enumeration or URL base 64, all the different encoding standards that are out there. So, for this, um, there's, a, there's an API, a core API, and the, the process around this API is to sort of standardize it into a framework for anyone that does want to do fuzzing, and that's the scriptable part. And also, in order to solve a problem of how do you group these payloads together, well, if you look at the testing guide, there's a, there's a long section of, of payloads in Appendix C, and they fall into two categories, replacive fuzzers and recursive fuzzers. And I'll come onto this, but basically, you're defining an alphabet when you're using recursive fuzzers, and replacive fuzzers, you're just sending literally uh, a statement replacing the section of the code there. And obviously, one is a subset of the other. The final problem that you're going to encounter is that, well, you can't really use conventional uh, protocol APIs that are out there. So. Let me give you an example. If you try to uh, use a standard Java library of uh, uh, sending, um, crafting a URL and opening a URL connection, and this URL connection uh, has as HTTP version number that, it's never going to get on the wire because that statement there is going to actually throw an exception. Okay, so you don't get as far as putting anything on the wire if you use conventional Java or similar APIs because it breaks the protocol specification and it makes sense. So, how do you solve that problem? Well, I'm going to have to solve another problem first. Okay, so. How do you solve that problem? You go a layer down. You implement everything as a socket or a, an SSL socket, and then you gradually build in the features that you want from HTTP 101109. Now, you don't actually need to implement a full HTTP specification in order to fuzz. All you're interested is the terminating conditions of the protocol session. So you don't really have to worry too much about um, chunked encoding, you have to address it, but the work that you need to do when going from sockets to the protocol specification is far less than extending or expanding um, Java URL connection or the Apache HTTP Commons library. So these are the likely problems that you're going to have if you try to uh, put together a fuzzer for web applications. How do we address these problems? Well, on, on the simplest of uh, uh, the categories, the user interface, have a graphical user interface that updates in real time, straightforward. Um, requests, responses in tables, so group them together so that you can sort them, etc. And also offer a bit of basic UI features, color coding, etc. Again, this is, I don't want to spend too much time on this. But if you look at the first, uh, the first actually graphical user interface, which was coded in uh, October 2006, you can see that it's a very basic GUI, and then little by little, we start adding to it. There are different categories, and finally we reach the stage that we're at today, 
where pretty much you've got three different panels, etc. So all these are not defined. Even if you buy commercial tools, especially commercial tools two years ago, didn't have uh, a grasp, firm understanding of what a fuzzer needs to look in terms of a UI. So in terms of the problems that we have in the core, and this is where it gets interesting, well, we need to be able to to implement this concept of recursive and replacive fuzzers and use alphabets and actually group all these into categories and then open that up for developers to use it for their own code. So this is really the nuts and bolts of how core fuzzing has been standardized uh, using what came out of the testing guide and really the need for grouping fuzzers into many categories. So if I bring up the actual GUI, hit the payloads tab. So how, how does this work? Well, we've got any number of categories. Uh, and these categories have a number of fuzzers inside. Each fuzzer is unique and has a number of payloads. And that fuzzer is recursive or replacive. Pretty straightforward. Now, each payload has a number of properties, and in this case, it's something very trivial and simple, but if we look at the cross-site scripting category, for example, all of a sudden you'll see, let's pick ASP.NET validation requests, recently broken. Okay, and here you have the exact payloads that you need. So here's a replacive fuzzer, whereby you can, at the click of just adding this particular ASP.NET validation request fuzzer to uh, a particular section of our request uh, that we're sending here, we can very easily just check for ASP.NET validation if it's broken on a particular um, input parameter. Actually, this would have to be on a post request, so if we, if we make this a bit more real, it would have to be this. Uh, and then the parameters would look something like uh, So this would be a, a typical example, let's say, of parameters. So then we would just, in order to check the form field, we would just add that particular category here, not selecting the equal sign. OK, again, basic stuff. So where does all this actually take us? So what, what can we do with, with all this? What, why? Why are we doing all this? It's very often very good to have some uh, stimulus to operate. So if I were to test, here's a, a typical example that uh, I quite often quote. So here's the CIA website. And if we were to check what version numbers they support on their website, um, so in this case, I would just add, there we are. So that one digit, I just want a base recursive base 10 fuzzer. So this will just iterate through all the possible 0 to 1, 0 to 9, sorry, statements. Now, if we do have an internet connection, and it's going over HTTPS. OK, so hopefully, if we don't get, oh, excellent. OK, so this is where it starts getting interesting, because all of a sudden, you see a very popular website and what's what's let's let's see what the results are here so if again i pull up a graph of this well notice that we're getting actually a decent file size 